There we go. So welcome, everybody, officially, although we have been chatting before I hit the record button for some time, uh, to this afternoon's uh, talk, Secret Britain, which is being delivered to us graciously by Mary Ann O'Hotter. Um, Mary Ann will be familiar to some of you, particularly in the UK and possibly in the US, actually, for her television work, um, known certainly in the UK as a presenter for time team and regular appearances on sky news delving into the newspapers amongst other things um also as a co-host of the series mythic britain which was i think originally for the smithsonian channel and was then uh, later screened on paramount after that um also for her books, which she will cover later on, um, and live events, which I believe she will also talk about later on too. Um, Marianne is also a strong advocate of the outdoors, which is something you'll be hearing a lot about this afternoon, um, and does a lot of work with the National Trust and Ordnance Survey in the British Mountaineering Council and your ambassador, aren't you, for, for various outdoor things. So um, we will go into the uh, rather rainy outdoors out of my window, but virtually sunny outdoors, uh, and learn about some of the mysterious past of Britain from archaeologist, anthropologist, and TV presenter Mary Ann O'Hotter. Mary Ann, thank you so much for being here. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you all for joining me uh, this afternoon. It's a great pleasure to spend an hour talking about one of my favourite subjects, which is weird and mysterious archaeology. Now, the items and the artefacts and sites that I'm going to be talking about um, this afternoon are drawn from this book, Secret Britain, uh, which came out last year. And in it, I've selected 75 different sites and artefacts from across the country that, for me, really capture the essence of, of what drew me to archaeology in the first place which is, uh, to be blunt, why people are so very strange and do very odd things, but in a, a sincere way. So the earliest item in here is the um, earliest human burial that's ever been discovered in Britain uh, in a cave on the Gower Peninsula in southern Wales, um, uh, of the body of a, a, a young man covered in red ochre. We're not really sure why. In association with mammoth bones, we're not really sure why. Halfway up a cliff, overlooking, well, what is now the sea, but used to be a savannah. Uh, well, a kind of, you know, a Welsh, a Welsh seven estuary kind of savannah. The most recent artefact I'm actually going to talk about uh, this afternoon, which was um, taken into a, a museum collection in 1916. Uh, but when I get to it, uh, you'll see that perhaps um, it's even closer to us in, in terms of familiarity than, than even that. Fundamentally, the things that connect all the different sites and artefacts in Secret Britain is that Archaeological science has enabled us to understand an awful lot about what happened in the past in places and in situations where people didn't necessarily write everything down. And I'm not a historian. I'm not going to I'm not going to go off on a massive history bashing session, but uh, never be fooled by those people who say, well, it was written down on a document therefore this must be true go no 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 no. well what does the material culture what does the archaeology tell us how does that change our perception because history is written by the the victors it's also written partially um it's it survives partially and there's always an edge there's always an angle isn't there when we write things down when we tell stories to ourselves or to each other um, archaeology similarly needs to be interpreted, but the material culture, the things that people dropped, threw away, lost, you know, chucked into a ground because it was rubbish, the way they built their house or the way they constructed the walls of a farmyard, often those things aren't overly thought through in the way that we want to use them to interpret and to try and understand the people's lives of the past. And I think that's why I find archaeology an absolutely compelling subject, because it helps us look 
with fresh eyes at things that we perhaps sometimes think we know all the answers about, except we really don't. And when you do really look at the archaeology of Britain, ours is a small island that's heavily populated and has been permanently populated for, for 10,000 years by all sorts of different people, migrating, emigrating, coming, going, trading, networking, um, changing things when they're here and then changing things as they leave and then the next layer of people change more some of it survives some of it's altered some of it is is dispersed or, or erased when you look at the evidence that those people have left that layer upon layer it's kind of like an, a, a really lumpy onion when you look at that often it's contrary often it's conflicting often when you look at the evidence, it raises as many questions as it answers. And I think that's absolutely brilliant. Some people go, well, you don't really know what you're talking about. You'll probably say it's ritual. But I think that is where the essence of archaeology lies. We don't have all the answers and we don't profess to, which is a more honest account of how we understand the past and how indeed we understand the present. But it's also a place where we can wonder and where you and I and the person that hopefully you might tell about what you hear about in the next hour or so go did you know that back 3000 bc they were doing this that and the other thinking out cool that sounds strange why were they doing that why why were they doing that and your guess at a certain point your guess is absolutely as good as the most eminent professors is as good as 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 the the, the kind of the person that you you have a very casual conversation with as the person who's read the book from cover to cover because that's where we bring our human sensibilities. That's where we br begin our, our sort of, I don't know, the, the kind of human creative interpretation of, well, why would I do that? Is it because I love my family? Is it because I want to show off? Is it because I am trying to appeal to the gods or appease the gods? And those urges to, to protect yourself, to protect your family, to protect your possessions, uh, those urges to achieve greatness or atone for sins, perhaps. Those, those instincts and urges have been with us since time immemorial, I think, and you see that in the way that people have changed the world around them. Which leads me, sort of neatly, if you will, to the first site that I want to talk to you about, which is this one. Uh, this is Cresswell Crags in Somerset. It's a, a natural uh, geological phenomenon. It's a really deep gorge and it's um, lined with natural caves in the limestone. In one of the caves, uh, a cave known as Goff's Cave, uh, some hundred or so years ago, oh mate, uh, no, maybe almost 200 years ago now, the remains of six humans were discovered and they were dated to about 14,700 years ago, quite specific, um, which l puts us into the Ice Age. So it's the Paleolithic, if you like a label, the Old Stone Age, but it's also the Ice Age still in, in the British Isles. So it's very cold, but there are these periods where the weather is warmer and people can walk across from the continental landmass, basically across what is the North Sea, Doggerland, if you've heard of that, they walk across Doggerland and into southern England and Wales, uh, probably following large game, things like horses, things like deer, things like mammoth, um, to hunt maybe to forage, maybe to um, exploit marine resources. That's a, having a seafood dinner to, to you and me without the, the fancy word. Um, and it was probably quite marginal. They were here for short periods of time and then probably walked back across Doggerland to, uh, to the Netherlands, well, what is now the Netherlands, um, for a slightly warmer, slightly easier life all the rest of the time. Um, and the evidence that we found in Goff's cave is is quite partial because it's a very old and b it survived ice ages which are generally not considered to be uh, particularly kind to fragile archaeological material but what we do find are parts of the human uh, skeletons of these six individuals that are found in this cave we find skulls now you don't need to be a professional doctor to know that this skull is missing some bits because obviously it should probably have the face bones attached to it. This is the top bit, the sort of skull cup, the cranium. 
uh, so it's now turned upside down. And the archaeologists describe what's happened to this skull in order to uh, for it to, to be the way it is as skilled post-mortem processing of the head. Uh, apologies if you're having your tea because it's going to get a little bit technical just for a short period of time. This isn't because uh, the ice and the stones rolled them around. Perhaps there was a, a kind of um, saber-toothed cat trundling into the cave and having a gnaw. This is a human created artifact because what they've done is they've carefully using sharp flint blades peeled away the scalp they've cut away the skin on the face and then they've chipped off the face bones up here and they've trimmed it looks a bit rough but um if you look closely um in in real life what you can see is that they've kind of smoothed out those edges so it's kind of smooth otherwise it'd be very sharp and jagged and you, you might cut yourself you know, imagine breaking a, a chicken bone and it's very sharp and fractured. Well, this has all been smoothed over, kind of sanded down, if you will. So it makes a cup or a bowl. Why would they do that, Marianne? Well, it's a, a very excellent question. Uh, there are very much easier ways of creating something to, for example, hold liquid. You could use the intestines of an animal or the stomach. Uh, you could use a hide. You could um, use a, a kind of naturally um, a shaped hole in the floor that you line with clay so it becomes pretty much waterproof, something like that. Uh, but no, they've gone for a human head minus the brains and the face and all the other bits. They didn't stop there though, did they? No, no. This is a, a human arm bone. At each end, it's been chewed. And uh, forensic archaeologists can tell what kind of creature has chewed it because of the shape of the teeth. It was chewed by a human. It was also cut, again, with flint knives by a human because saber-toothed cats don't use flint knives. And, as you can see in front of you, it's also got this kind of very delicate feathery chevron pattern engraved into it, uh, which is not, of course, accidental. There are filleting marks, there are filleting cut marks, so it appears that it's been quite carefully, the bone has been quite carefully filleted out of the arm and then decorated and chewed. Now, often when we see chewed bones that have been split particularly, it's uh, an interpretation is generally that people were hungry and they're trying to get to the marrow inside the bone because that's a very rich, nutrient rich resource. It's got lots of fat in it. It's got lots of calories. If you're going to eat the bits of an animal, whether that be um, a reindeer or a, a human, um, you know, you kind of want the, the kind of it's not the Jack Sprat would eat no fat. It's the wife who would eat no lean. Eat all the fatty bits, eat all the juicy, juicy bits, because they're the bits that are going to. Um, fill you up and keep you warm in your ice age winter. So what's going on here? Are these people eating other people and leaving the, the remains of dinner effectively in a cave? And are they doing that because they're hungry? Uh, a, a, a situation known generally as starvation cannibalism. It really is your, your absolute last um, possibility of survival and so maybe the person who dies first in the group gets eaten or perhaps even you know it's the kind of the drawing of lots and you go all right you're it uh you know sacrifice yourself to save the rest of us because you know you're in the ice age if hunts haven't gone well you can't not nip down to uh, to the supermarket but the thing is if you're dying of starvation if the writing really is on the wall who is sitting around doing skilled post-mortem processing of human heads who indeed is uh doing kind of bit of feathery arts and crafts on on the arm bone of grandma mm, certainly not me i don't think so i think we need to look to different interpretations and the most compelling interpretation is that this is ritual cannibalism uh, maybe not in aggression, maybe not as a kind of method of triumphing over a, a, another tribe or another hunting gathering group that you come across. You know, ah, we got them, we killed them and now we've eaten them. Although it could be that. Perhaps the way that these bodies have been dealt with is an indication of, of respect. You are, of course, after all, what you eat and what better way to keep those close to you close to you than by consuming them. I don't know. 
the experts don't know. They can describe what happened to the bodies. They can describe what probably happened in, in what order. But at the point we kind of then go, but why did they do that? Your guess, my friends, is as good as any experts. So answers on the postcard. I'm sure you might want to uh, have a chat in the chat, but maybe hold on to those thoughts and, uh, and we can discuss and consult at the end of the talk. So a little bit gruesome, but I thought, you know, you're up for it. Or if you're not, well, tough, you had it. So that's 14,700 BC. People are eating each other in Somerset. Let's now scoot to 300 BC. This is the Iron Age. So people are no longer hunting and gathering. They're farmers and they have been for some 2000 years or so. And you've got one lot of farmers who probably come in at the start of the Neolithic, the late Stone Age, the people who build Stonehenge, the people who build those big kind of stone monuments. Um, but then you get probably a whole new set of people turning up in the Bronze Age. Don't get too too caught up on the on the dates. If you want to do dates, then I'm going to suggest buy the book. But these folk are the people who were around when the Romans turn up. These two artefacts were discovered in an Iron Age hill fort. So for those of you who are down in Devon, you will have some some kind of pretty good hill forts nearby. Uh, the most famous and the biggest is just uh, over the border in Devon, uh, Maiden Castle. It's a whopper. That's in the book too. Um, but this, these, these two uh, artefacts were discovered in a slightly smaller, slightly simpler hill fort uh, called Castel Nadolig. Uh, forgive my pronunciation, it's probably a bit rubbish, uh, but in Welsh it means Christmas Castle. And it's in Ceredigion. And they were discovered when some labourers were digging into a mound near the, uh, near the hill fort. Uh, for gravel and and uh, stones to fill the potholes in the local road and they went oh well that looks like a lightly lump of of earth and stones we'll use that and then they kind of came across some bits of old bone chuck them away oops and these two things which are tentatively described as spoons they're about the size of a, a sort of a chicken's egg. And uh, you can see these little bits. I don't know if you can see my cursor. Oh, um, there we go. Can you see these little circles, the kind of flat bits? They are interpreted as being the place where you hold the spoon, the equivalent of a handle, basically. Now, this funny kind of spoon is pretty much a rare and strangely local phenomenon. Only 23 of them have ever been discovered and all bar one pair have all they've all been discovered in Britain and Ireland. The other pair was found in France and all of them bar three were found in pairs and the assumption is that the three who were which were found on their own probably did have a pair uh, but the pair got lost somehow. These spoons have certain characteristics that are very, very common. They're, they're shared across all the kind of the spoons. The first is that one of the spoons has a hole in it, normally just to one edge. And the other spoon is scored into quarters. Can you see that line where it's kind of the, the cir circle, circle-ish circle, is, is cut into quarters? And the interpretation well okay so then we get to the question why what on earth are these sometimes they're found um buried they look like they've been buried carefully but in kind of confusing contexts we don't know whether they're buried as a sort of a gift or they've buried to be hidden four pairs have been found buried with a body these ones we're not sure because the kind of description of what the workmen discovered with bits of old bone that they then threw away you think well was that actually a burial uh, and these spoons were the obvious thing to hold on to and the bits of bone weren't we're not really sure because sometimes obviously if you're a workman looking for gravel you're not an archaeologist looking for archaeology so the the kind of the the the, the attention and the focus was uh, in a different place so we're not actually sure if this pair of spoons was associated with a burial but we can't be sure so we're going to say they weren't the four pairs that have been discovered associated with a burial are really quite 
odd. One pair in Deal in Kent, <coughs> down in the southeast corner, that one was discovered where the spoons were either side of the person's head. And then there was another one in uh, France, the, the, the pair that was discovered in France, uh, where the spoons were one inside one another, spooned, if you will, in a bag, under an upturned bowl that was then placed on the dead person's arm. It was a woman on, on, on top of her arm. There was a pair in Berwick in Northumberland in the northeast that was found in... <laughs> I love this because it's really weird. In front of the person's face, a man, a man's face, in front of his eyes. And also in the grave was a piece of coal, an iron knife and a small pig. No, I don't really get that either. But it obviously meant something to someone. So what were these spoons for? And possibly were the spoons being buried with the person who had used them in life? Again, we don't know because people don't bury themselves. Lots of complicated things are going on when people are putting things into graves. Either you want to get rid of it because it's suddenly dangerous because it's associated with a dead person. Maybe you want to give it to them to take with them on their journey into what happens after you die, whatever kind of place you're going to or journey you're going on. Perhaps they want to give it as a, a gift of respect. Perhaps they want to do it to demonstrate to everyone standing around the grave that you are really, really rich and special and you don't even need to keep these. You can put them in the ground because you've got loads. You're really rich and special. All these are options. But what were the spoons for? Why might they have been associated with particular individuals and what on earth were they being used for all the rest of the time? Well, the most compelling interpretation might not be right, answers on a postcard once again, is that they're used for divination, for some kind of fortune telling. And the reason that you've got a whole spoon, this one up here with the hole in it, and you've got a quartered spoon divided into quarters, is because you use the whole spoon to either randomly or you know by the power of the gods or the power of your shamanic interpretation create some kind of pattern that can be read that foretells the future or offers some kind of insight or advice so like reading the entrails of an animal or reading tea leaves at the bottom of your cup maybe these are fortune telling spoons now there's a couple of ways that you could use them as fortune telling spoons uh, well, probably more than two, uh, but the most uh, the most obvious ones perhaps might be that you put something in the whole spoon up here, maybe liquid, blood, powder. Your guess, again, good as mine. Let's say uh, let's say liquid. Let's say um, blood. Why not? It's Friday afternoon after all. We're all feeling full full throated and red blooded at this point of the the week. Um, so you put a bit of blood up here in the whole spoon, and then you hold the quarter spoon underneath. And you kind of hover it about in your, and it splatters. And then you look at the quarters with the splatters and you can read what it tells you. Or perhaps you, you kind of go to the, the shamanic, the priest, the druid, whoever this person is, to read the information on the spoon. The alternative is that you put the spoons together like this, whole spoon and quarter spoon, and maybe you put whatever the liquid or powder is in your mouth and you blow through the hole onto the other spoon and again you get some kind of pattern or spray or drip that you can then read. At this period of time in the Iron Age, if you look at the Roman writers, there's some literacy in Iron Age Britain. Uh, normally people go, oh they didn't write anything down, they couldn't read and write. They could because they were interacting with the Roman Empire, they were trading, there was runic inscription, there was ogham, uh, but People weren't writing down everything in the way that the Romans were. Dear diary, today I met some barbarians. They weren't doing that. Um, and so what you've got is Romans, particularly Julius Caesar, who fancied himself as a bit of an ethnographer as well as a you know glorious emperor, writes about the people of Britain and Gaul. And he particularly is taken by the Druids, this kind of priestly caste who appear to have very strong and centralised uh, organisation 
and influence over the people. Um, and he writes about the Druids and what they do. And he's particularly writing at this point about the Gaulish, the, the ones in what is now modern day France. But the likelihood is that that kind of culture, that perhaps religious system is also uh, familiar in, in Britain, even if there are some regional differences. What Julius Caesar says about the, the Druids in Gaul is that they don't count time by days. They count the passing of time by nights. And they particularly focus on the cycle of the moon, a lunar cycle. And so you have months, lunar months, that are divided into full, waxing, waning, and new moon quarters. And I, for one, wonder whether these spoons actually read moon time. Because what you've got is a quartered spoon that could quite easily demonstrate or indicate the quarters of a moon lunar month. So maybe this is counting moon time. And maybe that's one of the ways that the Druids or whoever these intercessors were, were interpreting both time, the right time perhaps to, to marry, to go on a journey, to have a big fight with your neighbours, um, to, uh, to plant the crops. Uh, it doesn't always have to be fighting, it might also be growing. Um, and it might be measuring moon time, which I really love. I love the idea that we uh, now count days and we look at the sun or perhaps look at our phones. But actually, uh, dial, the, dial the clock back 2,000 years and you'll be counting in nights. Actually, kids do that, don't they? They kind of go, oh, only five sleeps to Christmas. So maybe we're going back to a kind of druidic counting of, uh, of time. We just need to bring back the, uh, the, the fortune telling divination spoons and then we're, we're back to back to the glorious olden days. Because Mark invited me to, to, to give this talk and because they're in Devon, I thought I should talk about something Devonish. And this is Dartmoor. Uh, for those of you over the big pond, Dartmoor is in the southwest. It's an extraordinary landscape. It's quite wild. If you come and visit, it might not be on the obvious TripAdvisor list, but it should be because it's really epic. It's a really extraordinary uh, landscape. Uh, very nice if you like hill walking, but do wear waterproof boots or bring spare socks because you'll get wet feet. Um, it covers about a thousand square kilometres. In old money, that's almost 400 square miles. And it's quite a wind blasted moorland now, certainly in parts, with these extraordinary natural rock formations known as tors, which are kind of very sculptural, but entirely natural. But there are also stone alignments on Dartmoor and lots and lots and lots of archeology. span It seems like a very depopulated, wild, wildernessy kind of place now. But if you went back to the to the Bronze Age, even to the Iron Age, to the Neolithic, the, the first and early farmers, then this was a very populated landscape. It was busy because the peat hadn't really uh, started to form yet. And so the land was quite fertile. It wasn't, you know, a bread basket to end all bread baskets, but it was a pretty decent place to live. You could raise cattle, you could grow corn and wheat. Uh, oats, you could grow turnips, all that stuff, you know, the stuff that keeps you fit and healthy. It was so populated that we know of more than 20,000 archaeological sites on Dartmoor and there are countless more hidden in the peat that we just simply don't know about because they're, they're not visible and they've never been uh, disturbed because, because people don't go around digging up enormous bits of, of Dartmoor to kind of build car parks or new sky rise uh, buildings or things like that. So they just lie there undisturbed but also unknown. And what you'll see is if you look at an ordnance survey map, uh, Mark Mark mentioned that I do like the outdoors. I do very much. I do love a map. And uh, if you're doing a bit of armchair landscape spotting or you kind of want to wander through the archaeological archives but not go outside or you're not able to, then I would absolutely recommend looking at maps, not just modern maps, uh, but look at Google Earth because you can see loads of cool archaeology from the satellite imagery. And also a, a site that's run by... Um, uh, the National Library of Scotland, NLS, which enables you to compare side by side or as overlays modern maps and modern, modern satellite images with uh, old maps. So things like um, 
the, the, the very early Ordnance Survey maps from the 1800s. So you can kind of strip away all that modern stuff and see what was there before. It's ever so cool. Totally free. Google it and you'll find it. Or I could send a link. I could put a link in the, in the chat as well. When you look at a modern Ordnance Survey map, you have to look at the OS 1 to 25,000, the Explorer series. And what you'll get are these quirky little labels in that gothic font can you see it says ken and kissed or hut circles and it's all very yoldy now that's a, a font that is exclusively used to indicate archaeological sites where at some point either it's a scheduled monument so protected in law <coughs> excuse me or uh, someone has gone out and surveyed it and said, ah, oh, yes, this is an archaeological lump and bump, not just an any old lump and bump, not natural or not modern. Uh, weirdly, in the um, internal logic of Ordnance Survey, uh, you also get a particular other font that isn't this kind of modern one, this nice, neat sans serif one. Uh, you get a kind of a very neat... Um, uh, font that is uh, in capital letters and that's only used for Roman remains, uh, Roman archaeology. So it'll say something like Roman road or fort, then you know it's Roman. But if it's archaeological either side of the Romans, so anything prehistoric or anything post-Roman, so it could be a medieval barn or it could be a Bronze Age uh, stone circle it gets the same font i don't know why the romans are special but they are they get their own font when you look on dartmoor you'll actually see this gothic font here labeling archaeological remains and most of it will probably be prehistoric but some of it may well actually be medieval because there was a period of time in the medieval period when uh, there were lots of peasants and they were pretty desperate for land and so they came onto dartmoor made the best that they could of the land that they could farm before it kind of basically turfed them off because the, the gains were so marginal. For our purposes, what we're looking at here is actually a prehistoric settlement. So what you've got is settlement. Well, there, there's a clue, isn't there? But you've also got hut circles, cairns and kists. Kists are uh, stone boxes uh, normally associated with burials. Cairns is a, a heap of stones settlement and hut circles they're the interesting ones i think for me um because now you can walk onto dartmoor find these hut circles and you will literally see a circle of stones that are the foundations of someone's house from probably the bronze age uh, possibly a little bit earlier so that's about four thousand years old and what you'll probably see is on the southern side a little entrance and you can walk in that's their front door you can walk in through the front door and then you're standing in someone's house we're not sure but it appears that this uh, orientation makes a lot of sense if you don't have much access to artificial light then you probably want the door of your house facing the uh, the, the the sun as it comes through the, through the sky so it rises in the east sets in the west and so uh, in in Britain, uh, you get a south facing uh, a south facing door is a useful thing because that's where you get most of the light and a little bit more warmth. There's probably a hearth in the middle of that circular home, and it would have had built up walls and then a, a thatched roof, probably thatched with heather or something like that, maybe grass or or a, a kind of. Um, uh, uh, a thatch made of, of the kind of straw from, from uh, crops that you'd harvested. Probably not so much reeds, because you don't really get reeds on Dartmoor. In other places, the people thatched with reeds. And what's really fascinating about Dartmoor is that that orientation with the, the, the hearth and the, the south-facing door, that bit's quite obvious. But actually, when they excavate these hut circles inside a house, there's a, a pattern that starts to appear and you see the pattern not just in Dartmoor, you see the pattern in hut circle settlement sites in across the south of England. You see it in Wales, you see it in Scotland, you see it in the islands and highlands. And it appears that what you have is, as you travel clockwise around the house, you appear to have women's work. I know that's a bit dubious. You, you appear to have domestic work that appears to be associated with um, 
items that are then found in association with female burials, that's a better description, on that western side. As you go around, the northern side appears to be um, kind of left in, in, a, in a dark place, perhaps also where the beds are. And then as you come round, what you tend to find are things like weapons and things like metalworking. So you've got a kind of division between the domestic and the um, uh, metallurgy and weapon making and tool making uh, work. And when you look at hut circles, it seems that perhaps there's some kind of association of the way you travel around the hearth and around these different areas of activity. It's kind of practical, but it also appears to have some kind of spiritual significance, perhaps, for how people structure their house and which bits are most private, which bits are most public, where maybe you put the, the kids and the cooking pots and where you put the, 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 the spears and the... Uh, and the idols that you worship as your gods. We're not really sure. Some of it is a bit um, sketchy and you've got to fill in the answers. And on Dartmoor, not only do you have these kind of cosmological houses, you've also got these really odd alignments of stones. You get lots of standing stones, you get cairns, and then you get these things, these stone rows, really random. The shortest one is three metres long and the longest one is about three and a half kilometres long. Often they're single rows, sometimes it's a double row but also quite close so not obviously an avenue that you walk within. Sometimes you get a triple row. On Cosden Hill you get loads of stones in a kind of weird grid pattern. What are they for? We don't know. Why are they only in Dartmoor? We don't know. It might partly be because they survive better on Dartmoor because no one ploughed them or built a housing estate on Dartmoor. Uh, whereas if there were stone rows under what is now Wolverhampton, we can't see them anymore because they're not there anymore. But there does some, so appear to be something kind of remarkable about the people of Dartmoor building these stone rows, these stone alignments. You do also get them in France. Uh, so maybe the people of Dartmoor had uh, strong associations with the people of France. Um, they were mining tin in, in prehistoric times, which is an essential component of uh, making bronze, which was the, the kind of the, 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 the fancy and very tradable and get rich quick material in, in, uh, in the Bronze Age because you would use it to build uh, to create tools and weapons. So maybe there's an association for the people of Dartmoor in their wild windswept moorland homes, except they weren't wild and windswept in moorland then. Um, with people in France. Maybe they had their own kind of special thing going on. I think uh, anyone who's visited a, a particularly small hamlet or village in Dartmoor now probably thinks that they still have their own special kinds of things going on there. Um, kind of fiercely independent, fiercely, um, you know, chin up to the wind, you know, they won't be tamed and neither will the landscape. But I think it's absolutely extraordinary that when you go to Dartmoor, you have to kind of see beyond the moorland and see beyond the peat and look at what would have been actually quite a kind of an idyllic, bucolic landscape full of settlements, full of maybe these are an equivalent of um, uh, some kind of parish church kind of setup where it's your local place that you go to that has spiritual significance. They don't appear to be territorial boundaries, certainly, but maybe they're kind of more spiritual or ritual boundaries. We don't know. As before, go and visit Dartmoor, trundle up and down these stone rows and circles, try and work out what the alignments are or what stories they might be telling about the landscape, and your guess is as good as mine. And then find yourself a hut circle, go in through the door, sit down, have a cup of tea in someone else's house. I'm conscious of the time. So what I'm going to do is finish with this one, which is Glastonbury Tor in Somerset. Um, there are lots and lots of archaeological sites in Britain. Uh, some of them are famous, very famous, uh, like Stonehenge, or in fact like Glastonbury. <coughs> some of them no one's heard of really, and they're pretty much overlooked. But um, even the famous ones, there are sort of secret stories to be unearthed about them and I think Glastonbury is Glastonbury Tor is is one of those and I just want to talk to you a little bit about what you're looking at in this image 
So for those of you who haven't ever been to the Somerset Levels, it's quite an extraordinary landscape. It's a, a natural floodplain and in the old days, before the drainage system was uh, as, quite so complete as it is now, even though it does still flood and probably will flood more due to climate change in the, in the coming years and decades, um, it would have very seasonally and very regularly flooded. And what you're looking at there is a natural hill, a natural high point, which would have always sat above the water, sort of like a, a shimmering aisle, if you will. But beyond, I mean, some of you are probably looking at that image going, that doesn't look natural at all, Mary, and what on earth are you talking about? Well, it is, but it's also augmented. It's been modified because, yes, you can see all these rows and rows of terraces and some people have said well maybe they're they're terraces for for farming uh, that are known as a uh, uh, strip linchets where you kind of basically think of um a sort of quintessential image of um, rice paddies on steep hills where you've kind of got um like a like a, a, a flight of stairs you've got a flat bit the tread and that's where you can grow your rice or in uh, the somerset prehistoric equivalent uh, turnips that's where you grow your turnips and then you step down and then you've got another flat piece of land but it's much harder to grow crops effectively on on steep steep ground but the thing is if you've ever been up glastonbury tour you know it's a rubbish place to farm you never get really very many turnips out of glastonbury tour because it's too rocky the soil is too thin it's 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 terrible so there's no reason to to modify a whole hillside for such marginal uh, crop production not even not even the hungriest peasant would do that so if it's not for a kind of practical farming purpose why else would you build a hill into a stepped pyramid well yes i am going to go for it ritual because of ritual and the thinking is that what the people were doing in Glastonbury in prehistoric times, probably the, the late um, Neolithic, so the sort of similar period maybe to when people up the road are building Stonehenge or Silbury Hill, what they're doing here in Glastonbury is transforming a natural hill into a monument by digging it into this artificial shape. Some people have said, oh, it's a maze, it's a, it's a labyrinth that leads you to the top, or is it a processional route? It's not as obvious as to kind of lead you on a, a spiralling route to the top, and it doesn't really work as a labyrinth. So I, I, some people buy it, but I, don't reject, I, I reject those, those interpretations. I think it is much more kind of to turn a natural hill into something that, as you're trundling along the lane across the Somerset levels, you go, what is that? And the answer is our special hill. Look how impressive and special we are. Or maybe that is the temple of the gods or the sanctuary of the gods or something like that. That's where the spirit of the marshes lives or the fertility goddess, whatever it might be. But what you can also see on Glastonbury Hill is that people treating this hill as a special place didn't stop in prehistory because what you can see on the top is a... Uh, church tower it's the remains of St. Uh, St. Michael's sorry St. Michael's Parish Church and it had a priory attached to it until the dissolution of the monasteries under King Henry VIII in the 1530s when um, there was a, a statement that uh, the, the, all the monasteries were going to be dissolved and their property and their wealth and their land would be uh, revert to the crown and so Glastonbury had an enormous abbey very rich and also this uh, this uh, uh, peripheral church that was also you know pretty rich they dissolved Glastonbury Abbey and apparently the abbot and some of the brothers some of the monks tried to hide some of the riches of the abbey from the uh, the king's accountants and the, the inquisitors and so they were hung drawn and quartered they were marched up to the top of the hill this very elderly abbot I think it was apparently in his 80s whether that's true or not, I don't know. But he's hung, drawn and quartered and strung up on the outside of this, uh, of this tower as a, as a, a lesson to others. Uh, you know, turn over all your goods, otherwise we'll come for you. There's also, it's also been uh, impacted by uh, earthquakes, uh, this, this tour. Uh, and so the church had to be hastily rebuilt. And the reason that they kept just the tower is, is because it's an extraordinary um, 
uh, monument. Uh, uh, it was still used as a place of sort of semi-outdoor worship by local people. And, and now, if you go to Glastonbury, you'll see that lots of other people are drawn to it. Uh, some people say it's a, a centre of ley lines. Some people say it's a space of uh, particular special Christian energies. All sorts of different interpretations for what is a very complex, archaeologically complex, but also spiritually complex landscape with a lot of interesting history to it. So I'd definitely recommend taking, if you can, taking a trip up Glastonbury Tour. The views are amazing, but also the archaeology is extraordinary. And the history, layer upon layer of history, from, from prehistory to the modern interpretations, contemporary uses of that site are extraordinary. And you go up to the top and you go, why? Why would people live up here? I can understand maybe why you'd build a church up here, but people prior to that lived on the top of the hill. Very windy. Uh... Not an easy place to get water. Why did they turn it into a layer cake? Don't know. So your guess is, as I always say, as good as mine. I realised that there was one other thing that I wanted to talk to you about, and it was the Headington Mandrake, wasn't it? And it was this, because that's the most recent artefact that is in the book. So I'm going to leave you just with this one, because this was discovered uh, or handed over to a museum researcher in Oxford uh, at the, Ash the Ashmolean Museum. Oh, no, sorry, the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford by a farm labourer in 1916. And it's known as the Headington Mandrake. Now, some of you will be familiar with oh Mandrake. I've heard of Mandrake from Harry Potter. Mandrakes are those things that the, the kids go on the gardening spell-making class. Can you tell I'm not a massive Harry Potter fan? I you know, the one they have to put the ear defenders on so they don't hear them screaming because otherwise they'll go mad or drop down dead or something. Well, people genuinely believe that. Believe that if you pull a mandrake out of the ground, its scream will kill you. And so the, you've got Roman writers writing about handling mandrakes, magical mandrakes, all sorts of special powers, by tying the 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 grassy uh, the, the kind of the leafy top of a mandrake to a dog and then tying a string to the dog and then pulling the dog and the dog pulls the mandrake and then the mandrake will scream and kill the dog but not you and then you've got your mandrake and you can do all sorts of magical special herbal remedies with it other people thought mandrakes only ever grow under gibbets because they're fertilized and they're fed by the dripping bodies of the damned I oh, know. No, it's not true. You can grow them in the garden. Um, and this, in fact, isn't even a mandrake. It's a, a bryony root. But the farm labourer who had it in 1916, so not that long ago, believed it was a mandrake and believed that he had to look after it very carefully and he nursed it like a little dolly or like a little baby. He fed it drops of milk and he wrapped it up in a little blanket to keep it warm and he kept it in his house to protect the home, protect his family, protect his animals and, and protect his crops and bring him good luck. And it was only when uh, researchers who were specifically looking for artefacts of folkloric intention um, approached him and probably offered him a sum of money, they said, we'll take that mandrake off you and you went, all right then, and, uh, and handed it over. And it's now on display in the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford. The reason mandrakes were often thought of as having uh, this kind of mystical and special power is because they kind of look a bit human-y and, and this one is, is no exception. It possibly has a head on the top, it has like little stubby arms maybe, it's got legs and a tail if you will. And people thought all sorts of things about these. This is why they kind of start to possess these kind of person-like traits, these characteristics, but also powerful, possibly dangerous. So look after the mandrake and it'll look after you. Don't look after the mandrake and all manner of ill will befall you. And I think it's absolutely extraordinary that someone, you know, 100 years ago was vehemently and earnestly and sincerely looking after a plant root uh, in order to bring luck to his family. But then actually you think about all the things that we do now, you know, whether that's putting on your lucky, so lucky socks before a job interview, whether that's, I don't know, turning the light off and on three times before you leave the house so you don't get burgled, whether that's putting up a, um, a, 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 a scroll with, with a, piece of, um, of, a piece of prayer on it to protect the home. We do all sorts of things to, to kind of ward off everyday magic to, to ward off or perhaps bring to us good luck. And so I think 
I'm going to leave you with the thought that as much as we stop and wonder at the weird stuff that people were doing in the past, I think uh, also take pause to, to stop and wonder at all the weird stuff that we do today. And I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, you could also have left it with the fact that uh, mandrakes are also very good for male virility and that might not be a tale. Really? Mm. Oh, well, there you go. There you go. That'll, spi that'll spice up the next version of your talk, <laughs> won't it? <laughs> well, maybe that's, that's partly, I mean, I wasn't going to get into it because it's a family audience, but which bodily fluids coming from the, uh, the, the gibbet hanging bodies? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's another good one. Probably not not for tea time, uh, not for no. tea time viewing. No, but there you go, mandrakes. You know. There you go. Billy yeah. gardens with them. Yeah, and obviously from a from a library perspective, obviously Professor Sprout's botany class. If we want to just fill in the Harry Potter detail there. Thank you, much appreciated. Thank <laughs> you. Good, good, good. Okay, let's make ourselves and David Tennant, who's sitting over my shoulder, bigger. Um, don't ask why David Tennant is sitting over my shoulder. <laughs> Right, let, let's go mad for the questioning. Look, I'm going to give people permission to start video, not to unmute themselves, but if any of you want to appear on screen and prove to Marianne and myself that you are actual well, real, real people. people. I'd like that. And, and make it look like an audience situation. Uh, you now have permission to do so. Do bear in mind that you will appear in the recording. So if you don't like what you put on this morning or you didn't put anything on this morning, um, maybe don't do that. Okay, right. We have some very good questions, which I'm just going to scroll back to the beginning of. Um, here we go, then. Uh, if, you, if, if any other questions come to mind, do please pop them in the chat uh, so that when I scroll down to the bottom in a minute, there are more questions. But for now, the first question was from Sally, who asks, and I think she's probably talking about the people who take part in this particular practice rather than the TV programme. What is your view of detectorists? Ah, uh, uh, the people who take... Uh, sorry, are we talking about the TV show? What did you no, just no. say? No, we're no, talk we're talking about people who... People who, who do metal, metal detect. detecting. Right, understood. Um, I think that responsible metal detecting has added an enormous amount of understanding to uh, archaeology. Um, bear in mind that in uh, the rules are different in England and Wales, in Northern Ireland and in Scotland. Uh, I have absolutely no idea what the rules are in the US and Canada. You're going to have to go and do your own research on that front. But in England and Wales, if you have the permission of the landowner and you are doing it responsibly so that you're going to legally declare any fines that you um, have to under law. Um, so anything that counts as treasure, you can get that, uh, uh, the definitions of that online. Go to fines.org.uk, which is the Portable Antiquities Scheme website. But also to do it responsibly, report all the other fines as well. The things that might not have massive financial value, but have huge and profound archeological and historical value, then I think you're doing all right. If you're not, if you're, particularly if you're detecting on already disturbed ground, so something like a plowed field, then there's, there's, there's no harm there. If you go, oh, hang on, I think I found a thing, like an actual thing, thing, big thing, stop digging. Go and get seek professional advice from from your your local fines liaison officer. Then I think, honestly, if we didn't have metal detectorists who were doing a fantastic job enthusiastically with passion and knowledge and a real sense of responsibility for their role in uncovering and understanding our our shared past, then I think we would have lost loads of things. We wouldn't know where uh, the Battle of uh, Bosworth was. For, for example, uh, we wouldn't have found a Viking spindle whirl that is engraved with runes asking for Odin's and Heimdall's protection at a time when Vikings in, in Lincolnshire should have been Christian. We'd, we'd have, have lost so many extraordinary things because they would have been ploughed up and, and, and lost entirely. So good detecting, fantastic. Bad detecting is evil and wrong and mostly illegal and don't do it and if you know people who are doing it report them excellent thank you we have a, we have entire hordes don't we as well that have been discovered you are the staffordshire horde well. yeah. yeah the staffordshire horde is what i think yeah. of particularly uh, yeah. the jersey horde there was a horde that was discovered quite recently of a whole pot of coins and because the detectorists stopped 
and it was able to be uh, excavated forensically they could work out how many different little bags of coins had been poured into the pot in what way whereas if you dug the whole thing up then you kind of go oh well it's just a bunch of coins we can't really interpret the context context is everything otherwise it's just a thing um and i think i think that's the that's the thing good detectorists understand that and they are part of the process and i think it's wonderful excellent thank you uh there was just a little Correction clarification that came up, Maiden Castle being in Dorset, not in Devon. Uh, oh, yes. Did I say it was in Devon? Sorry. You said, you said over the border in Devon, but you meant over the border in Dorset. I, That's I, we, what I we meant. We knew what Sorry. you meant. We knew okay. what you meant. It was just clarified. In the <laughs> Thanks, chat. Hazel. You're right. It is in Dorset. <laughs> okay. On spoons, then. Yes. Uh, so John, John asked, uh, if they put blood or any other liquid on the spoon with a hole in it, would modern science be able to detect traces? Very excellent question. Well, modern archaeological science can sometimes detect uh, the traces, remnants of what has been, for example, in something like pottery. So you can tell whether you've had cheese or milk products, whether you've had meat products because of the... Um, uh, you, you basically kind of get a sheen of animal fat or, or kind of um uh like milk proteins that can be in some contexts identified and analyzed but because these spoons are often found in in quite um sketchy contexts none of them have been found very very recently and so when they've been lifted that environmental evidence that the kind of the soil that was right next to the spoon hasn't been preserved and protected in a way that means it can't have been um uh what's the word um uh contaminated by other other products that you kind of have to do it like you're doing a, a sort of crime scene investigation because you need to make sure that you haven't contaminated with with your cheese sandwich uh, that you had for lunch so we don't know but thus far we don't know yet because no spoons have been discovered in a context that means that we can do that analysis uh, but thus far, therefore, thus far, no, we don't know. Um, it is possible, uh, but again, because it's metal, sometimes it's it's harder to to kind of it's it's less likely that you do get that that veneer that sheen because also a pot that is used to hold milk for the whole of its life ends up kind of absorbing the milk and it's all milky, whereas a, a spoon that is occasionally used or perhaps regularly but not all the time completely coated in blood or honey or whatever it is then uh, then there's less chance of that residue remaining not impossible but so far no cool thank you uh, more on the spoons from valerie is there any significance on the patterns on the handle handle of the spoon thinking in oh. terms of the sky disc okay oh now that's a good question hang on i'm just gonna find the i've got a copy of the book in front of me spoons where are you 188 hang on hold please call us mm -hmm. just so we can all consult i'm gonna hold them up oh break the spine of my book okay so the handles oh god i'm a tiny little thumbnail aren't i mm -hmm. um it's a it's a bit of a, a, com a tricky, it's a tricky label that some archaeologists hate, but basically this is a Celtic design. Um, so a kind of a, a fashion, an art tradition that is um, seen in um, metalwork particularly <coughs> from the Iron Age across lots of different indigenous groups at that point. So um in britain and in ireland in france and germany and spain put bits of spain um so there's no clear evidence that it means something that it's any kind of code and different spoons have different patterns on the little handly bits so there's no consistency so it doesn't look like they're all necessarily made in one place or by one workshop or by one uh, metal worker but that there's this kind of tradition of spoon making um, for about 400 years. And then it appears to stop about 100 AD. We don't find any more spoons. But bearing in mind, we've only ever found 23 of them, uh, 20 of them being in, pair, in pairs. So, so 10 plus three random ones. It's not a huge sample size to, to base it on. 
Um, so maybe there were loads and loads and loads of spoons, but I don't know, lots of them got thrown in the sea or melted down. We don't know. Um, but there's nothing obvious to interpret in the pattern except that it is makes it look nice, maybe? Makes it more fancy? We do it on our cutlery now. Why should it have been any different with those? Spoons? There you go. Yeah, some people have said, maybe they're just spoons, Marianne. Why are you getting so uh, elaborate <laughs> with them? But they're not very dishy, so they wouldn't hold your soup in very well. Much there better are, divining. <laughs> yeah, there, there are many ways that you can carry out divination um you know from from fruits and vegetables and hazelnuts and twigs and all sorts but, but chucking a bit of blood around on a spoon is a far better way than, than most why not let's be know. Let's people be are invited to uh, drill holes in their dining room cutlery uh, do a bit of experimental archaeology and report the results back i would be most interested yes if you divine the future with your spoons do email in and <laughs> Uh, Hazel pointed out three was a symbolic number for druids. That was also the yeah. spoon point. Um, Hazel also said, moving on to Dartmoor, if you're visiting Devon, I recommend going to Grimm's Pound, amazing Bronze Age settlement near Postbridge. Grim Grimm's Pound is a great location, first excavated by uh, the Reverend Sabin Baring Gould, a very well known antiquarian and author of historic and folkloric. Uh, books who was instrumental in setting up the archaeology section of the Devonshire Association. And uh -huh. the first, well, first excavation of Grimm's Pound, so there you go. Bonus there's, information uh, for the nothing image, there. Um, the image that I was showing was um, uh, Merivale. Yes. Uh, which is, is amazing, a, a really eclectic bunch of, of different aspects of monumental buildings that uh, mm. fill your boots with trying to interpret them. Merivale's great. Um, Fernworthy is a great location as well because Fernworthy, Fern, Fernworthy Reservoir um, has uh, hut circles and uh, old Clapper Bridge and medieval um, pack horse bridge and um, a kist or fairy well is the one that uh, Fernworthy Reservoir is known, all of which are submerged underneath the waters of the reservoir most of the time. But if you go up there right now, they're not because we've had so much dry weather that the reservoir oh. is low enough that you can see them all at the moment. I have walked oh, out wow. to the kist um and nearly drowned in the mud it's really it's the bottom of a reservoir you can imagine what it's like even when it dries out it's very tricky to get to but it's a great okay. location but also good stone circle and stone <laughs> rose in fernworthy forest as well well worth don't don't yeah. drown yourself in the mud folks don't no do, no, no don't do don't get stuck in the mud <laughs> no, there's some really good archaeology at fernworthy actually good. um is there going to be a link so we can listen to this later as well? Asked Kathy. Yes, there is. And you, I, I've answered that in the chat. You'll, you'll get an email with a link to watch this back so you can enjoy Marianne's words of wisdom once again later <laughs> on. Or we'll catch up on any bits you missed if Zoom failed you. Um, Glastonbury, having lived there and walked it many times, I would have thought it was some sort of terracing or natural creeping of the soil on a steep hill. Very difficult to walk it as a labyrinth. Yes, impossible to walk it as a, as a labyrinth or as some kind of processional walkway to the top of the hill. Absolutely agree. Um, but it's not what you describe as um, the soil creep. So for, for those of you going, what on earth is she talking about? Imagine a really steep hill. You get this kind of thing called terracet lines where basically that you've got a kind of grassy layer of the vegetation and then the soil is slowly kind of flowing in a sort of semi-liquid way it's not liquid but because it's soil um it's flowing underneath and so it kind of bloop, 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 bloop. imagine you know pouring chocolate sauce down the side of a, a bowl very very slowly very thick chocolate sauce but with a layer of grass and vegetation on the top and so what you get are these kind of tiny little terracets, these rows, tiny terraces. And then if you've got sheep grazing that, that ground, then the sheep will use those terracets as a natural walkway. And then it looks more intentional, but it's just a bunch of sheep trying to make their lives easier. And then if you've got walkers, then the walkers follow the sheep and then you do end up with more of a terrace. But on um, Glastonbury Tor, they are much more explicitly terraced and, and they have been worked. Um, there's no clear dating evidence for Glastonbury Tor. There's no definitive, but it, it looks like it was constructed or, or modified initially, certainly, in the Neolithic. So possibly around 3000 BC, plus or minus a few couple of mil no, 
few hundred years at least. More experimental archaeology should be about chocolate sauce. <laughs> I think so. Well, it's a good description. Chocolate sauce and, and mud, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or, and, and, uh, and grass, yeah. Uh, okay, we're on the other side of the uh, multitudinous thank yous which were placed into the chat at the end of the main talk and just a couple of subsidiary questions that came in afterwards or comments. Avril, maybe the spoons were put over the eyes of the dead as a form of protection. Uh, so coins, coins often, but, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we we know that coins were used for that purpose often, but yeah, yeah. maybe. Most people um, didn't have spoons, though. That's the thing. Mm. So, in the Iron Age, in the British Iron Age, you do get an awful lot of weird things being done with dead folk. There's um, uh, often you get um them them buried in the middle of settlements, uh, but kind of randomly because you've also got a kind of burial ground just up the hill. But then every now and then you'll find a body just outside someone's house. Um, could be a murderer, could be a, a murder victim, but it seems so consistent in settlements that something else is going on probably, or there were a lot of murderers. Uh, but you also get people kind of being deposited in old grain pits and things like that. Again, could be a murder, but again, it seems a bit too consistent. So maybe they're there to protect the grain, who knows? So people in the Iron Age were definitely doing weird stuff with their dead. Um, whether uh, whether the, the spoon people were special people who had special things uh, done to them because of their role in life, um, maybe the spoons over eyes or around a head suggest something about their powers or their ability to see, see in whatever, not just the, the physical, you know, through your eyeballs kind of way. I, like I don't the know. Idea, I like the idea of like the spoon it. people. If we put the spoon <laughs> people together with the beaker people, then we've got a way of eating soup. Well, there you go. Which is ultimately the the uh, the ultimate uh, achievement of humanity, surely. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and yes, uh, weird burials are a lot of fun. I mean, you covered deviant burials as well, didn't you, in Mythic Britain, if I remember. Mystic right, Britain, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I keep calling uh, it Mythic Britain. The... They, yes. they discovered a, a new deviant burial uh, just recently. I saw it in the news as well. Mm. So, you know, means of keeping people in the grave so they don't rise from the dead or cause trouble or mischief, yes. uh, generally, generally speaking. Um, apologies to Jenny McKenzie. Yes, there's quite a lot of Scotland in the book, but I just didn't put it in this talk. So, uh, yeah, there's good Scotland, but you have to get your book, copy of your book from mm -hmm. the library. Well, we'll come to that in just a moment. One, okay. one final question. Are archaeological sites on Bodmin Moor similar to the things you described on Dartmoor and Cornish? So feel obliged to ask. <laughs> well done. Well done. Well done. Uh, yes, is the short answer. Um, all those uh, southwest moorland, um, well, what are now kind of uh, rough grazing moorland um, or peaty sites, so Bodmin, Exmoor, Dartmoor, were not peaty in the Bronze Age and which much more populated. Uh, well, one of the things actually about them being much more populated, much more populated in, in the Bronze Age because the weather was kinder and climate enabled people to, to farm that land. But um, anything prior to the, to the 1200s onwards, uh, and then particularly in the, again in the 1500s and then again in the 1800s, you have what what was a kind of a communal land asset being taken into private possession uh, so in the 1800s these were the enclosures act in the 1200s it was just a kind of a landowner turfing the peasants off um generally because um producing sheep wool particularly rather than the the meat but wool was hugely more profitable than allowing a bunch of peasants to grow their turnips and have a few you know cattle and 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 sheep scratching away so instead you'd clear the village and you'd just have a bunch of sheep and perhaps one or two shepherds to look after the sheep and uh, and that's the start of uh, the urbanization of of uh, of uh, the, the british english population uh, people get turfed off the land and uh, I mean, if you want to sort of give me a cider and get me really political, that is the basis of, uh, of the uh, injustice of land rights, uh, even to this day. Sheep, they killed more medieval villages than the plague ever did. Well, sheep and, and landowners. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 
Uh, as a, a final <coughs> comment from Denise there, a spoon person might be a fun Halloween costume. Halloween's coming up. If you want to go out as a spoon person, that would be great. I'd like to see that. There you go, with the kind of moon spoons dangling in front of your face. Yeah. You see things. Yeah. I see things. Brilliant. Yeah, okay, let, let's cover one or two last minute, very important pieces of admin. Here is a link which I'm going to put into the chat, which will take you directly to the place where you can buy signed copies of Mary Ann's books. Oh, that's very Thank Mary Ann's you. website. Um, if you want to buy books and have Mary Ann scribble all over them, then go to that link. Yes, um, and I'm happy to send them uh, overseas as well. Apologies in advance when you go to my website and look at the price of postage. I know it's awful. I don't make any money on that. It is just how much I have to pay when I go to the post office. Um, and please make sure that you select where it's being sent to because otherwise it calculates the wrong postage. And then I have to email you and go, uh, I can't send it to you for £4.50 because it's going to cost me 40 uh, And it gets all very complicated. So please select the right one. I am also <laughs> having a new website uh, built as we speak. Um, so, uh, yeah, apologies. If, that that's not happened yet. If you live overseas, please choose International Economy, where it will take a very long time to get there, but be much, much cheaper to send. Ish. I mean, it's still expensive. I mean, you can get it from that big bookshop in the sky online. But if not, just go to your local bookshop and they will be able to order it for you. And then you're keeping a local business in business. And uh, and I will be just as happy with that. All of all of these options are good. But if you are available, if you are able to sensibly get uh, a signed copy, then that is the way that you can do so. I'm a big uh, fan of that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The other link I was going to give you is that if if having come to this talk, um and chosen a free ticket or or donated anyway and thought do you know what marianne was so good that i probably ought to donate again so that the library service can put on even more of these fantastic talks on a friday afternoon um because we do a whole series of these history talks which all the back talks are all on our youtube channel search for credit and library on youtube and you can go and watch all sorts of interesting things from fairies to maps to roman archaeology to many many other things but if you want to donate to the uh, library charity that runs us and the other libraries in Devon and Torbay, there is a link there that you can go and do so by clicking a donate button on our website. You are under no obligation to do so. We have just enjoyed your company and enjoyed having you here. But there is a way that you can do it if you want to support what we do. Thank you very much. I shall not mention that again. And finally, Marianne, you want to talk about other exciting stuff, what you are doing, don't you? One more plug, if I may, my friends. You, may. you enjoyed spending an hour with me. I certainly enjoyed spending an hour with you. Um, I assume, you know, your little thumbnails. I, I like to think that you're smiling behind them. Um, I'm doing a archaeology storytelling show, again, online, so you can be anywhere in the world. And there is a recording available afterwards. Um, and it's archaeology storytelling. So uh, myself and a, a professional storyteller, a guy called Jason Buck, have got together. And what we do is we take a real site or artefact and we use that as an inspiration to tell a story that either is or could be true about how it was used and how, what it meant to people at, from that time. So we're developing a whole new show. If you've seen some of our Secret Histories archaeology uh, storytelling shows before, um, this one will have all new stories. So we've got a, a Syrian, a Roman Syrian, who finds him, uh, him and herself in South Shields. We have uh, someone hunting a great game in the Ice Age. We have um, a, 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 a reboot of uh, two of my favourite characters that I've ever made up in my life called Joy and Dillard. Um, on their first outing in archaeological storytelling, they uh, created a witch bottle. And this time they're looking for the right place to hide a shoe that is going to protect their home and uh, a few more besides. So it's a two hour show. I'm going to post the um, link in the chat for tickets. Um, it's uh, fifteen pounds for a household for you know for a device. You can invite your friends and neighbours so you can all watch on one ticket, or ten pounds for concessions. Um, apologies that the um, I can't afford it budget tickets, uh, which are normally three pounds. They've already sold out, I'm afraid. So uh, it's either a standard ticket or a concession ticket now folks so do have a look that's uh, thursday the 29th of september at uh, half past seven in the evening uh 
British summertime. Yeah, we're still on British summertime. We are at Whatever time that is, if you're not in the UK. Amazing. And people get a recording link to watch that back afterwards if they book a ticket too? Yes, yeah. they do. And or you can uh, select, if you know you're not going to be available on that Thursday evening between half seven and half nine, then you can select the ticket that will simply send you the, it's a little bit cheaper. It's uh, £10 rather than £15 uh, to get the, the recording afterwards. Excellent. Uh, if you um, come to the live show, then you get all the banter as well. And you get to be involved with the bants, which is always nice. Absolutely. Uh, if that takes your fancy, and why would it not, then there is a link for you to follow or archive or whatever in order to go and do that. You can also search Eventbrite for Mary Anne, and you will find that link on there too. Um, what else are you up to, Mary Anne? Let's just close with that. I have a book that I probably should have written more of, uh, which will be my next book. And it's a bit more anthropological and it starts with the, the very earliest uh, hominin species. So the very earliest human species. And it will bring us all the way up to uh, the present day, uh, exploring um, our origins as a species and how we've got to where we got to. But it's not going to be really long, even though that sounds really long. It's going to be really short. So the principle is, I'm going to boil it down like a really juicy stock cube so you can read the whole of history of the human of hum, humanity in an afternoon, if you will. Um, so because I'm late, I had a baby, you see, so I do have a bit of an excuse for delivering it late. Um, but once we know for sure, I think hopefully it will be published if I write it in time. It will be published uh, early 2024. So just over 18 months time. We, we all have books that we should have written more of the manuscript of than we have at the moment. Do we? Oh, it's awful. I feel like I haven't done my homework. It's terrible. <laughs> uh, yes, but, I, I also but, have one that, I, that the publisher has given me no deadline for, so that's also oh, no. more uh, dangerous uh, because that, yeah, that no, will be I, I just never published write. in about 2030, probably. <laughs> Uh, okay. I'm working um, on a few other TV shows, uh, but I can't say too much about them. No, um, no. So, shh. We, we shall look forward to finding out more about those in due course. Okay, thank you so much. Finally, I am going to stop this recording. So it's all neat and tidy when I put it on YouTube. Whilst I'm doing that, everyone, please show your appreciation in the Zoom method of your choice to Mary Ann and her children that, as you will have heard, she squirreled away in a cupboard somewhere behind her. <laughs> yeah, about that. <laughs> Noisy Friday tea time. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, folks. We would have expected nothing less. We <laughs> show your appreciation to Mary Ann for taking the time to join us and give that fascinating talk this afternoon. Thank you.